Hello, here we are for part three of lesson six of CENG 4412, Steel and Concrete Design. Okay, so we bit, we've gone over a bit of review of finding, um, you know, uh, finding factored loads for beams, uh, looking at both, uh, in, in the, so as a review, in the first portion of the lecture, we looked at a, um, a discussion of just the properties of concrete and how it behaves. In the second portion of the lecture, we looked, reviewed how to do, uh, at a very basic level, uh, beam uh, load collection, um, load factoring, etc. Okay, now um, for part three, I'd like to go over the very basics of uh, reinforced concrete beam design. And again, all this is going to come out from the, uh, or going to come out of the uh, a a ACI 318-14 um, uh, 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 code. Okay, as we've discussed previously. So um, let's see. This is gonna first. I gotta uh, mention. I gotta. I gotta to really begin this. We have to bring this back to. Um, mechanics and materials. Now, but first of all, um, so again, we got to bring this back to mechanics and materials, and at least for our school at UT Tyler, uh, we need to, um, uh, we're going to, we use the title uh, for our course, C and G3306, Mechanics and Materials. But um, before I do that, or actually while I do that, I'm going to say from uh, C and G3306, or whatever um, mechanics materials class you have at your university, college, etc. That's really bad. E and C and G thirty three oh six. Well, um, if I make a few assumptions, I'm gonna make a f if I make a few assumptions about beams, I can do a few things. So, um, some primary assumptions we use in beam theory: uh, we assume that plane sections remain plane. Maybe I'll put a little assumptions title here. So we'll assume first. Assume one: uh, plane sections remain plane. A very common beam theory assumption. Uh, two, that everything remains linearly elastic. Uh, linearly elastic. And three, homogeneous. Now, this is an interesting assumption for concrete because we know that concrete is definitely not homogeneous. If you've ever seen any kind of concrete in your life, even for five seconds, you know that uh, concrete is not a homogeneous material. However, it's made of small enough particles and we use massive enough sections that uh, we, uh, when we design, we can usually assume that there's going to be enough, or we usually always, we actually always assume, uh, if we're going to design with it at all, that there is going to be, and that the, the, the particles are small enough, and that, that everything is bound together well enough, that we can um, really bring everything together. Like we, or, or we can transfer load from one weak spot to one strong spot, and as a whole, thing uh, it behaves as a homogeneous material. Okay, so please pay. So next, I'm going to go through a series of stress and strain and load diagrams, and really, the this is very important. So. Um, in terms of beam design, at least, these diagrams, they are one of the most important concepts you will learn in this entire course, especially in terms of concrete design. So this is going to be built out of a lot of the things you learned in uh, your mechanics and materials class, but really, uh, do not just breeze through these diagrams. Make sure you know them, make sure you understand them, because they really are one of the most fundamental and important aspects of this entire semester. Alright, so let's go through this. Uh, so first of all, let me draw a side view of our uh, beam, where I made the cut here, just at a generic location somewhere along the beam. And it wouldn't matter it, it, in terms of factor uh, to find in terms of finding the actual moment applied, uh, where you take the cut does matter. But in terms of where you take the cut, uh, as long as the co as long as the cross section is constant all the way across. Uh, it, it'll be constant. It, it won't matter where you take the cut. Now there are some cases in beam design where we do actually have uh, varying amounts in, of reinforcement at various places along the way, but uh, for this case, let's just assume we have a constant amount of reinforcement all the way across. Okay. So let me just draw out a cut here, and this is going to be the side view. So let's consider a side view here. And uh, I'm first going to label one dimension, and uh, this is going to be uh, well. Actually, the, when I say side view, I actually mean the side view of the beam. So um, this is this is the cut plane right here. 
so at that cut plane, uh, there is going to be, uh, to keep this in equilibrium, there's going to be a couple of things. Well, I'm going to have my uh, load W here, my ultimate load. Then there's going to be some shear load balancing this. Uh, well, it could be positive or negative depending, but let's just say I have some shear load balancing this. And then some moment also keeping this thing in balance. Uh, let, me, let me make clear that's a shear load and a moment. Some internal moment balancing this thing. So this is the side view, and this is sort of a, a brief, uh, very rough, uh, three, a very rough free body diagram showing the internal forces therein. And I want to introduce a new variable, um, and we're going to go through a couple variables, and I'm going to use the same variable names that are used in the ACI concrete code. So um, first of all, if you have a beam and it's cross section uh, with a certain cross section or rectangular beam, we're going to call the height h and the width b. Now if you had something other than a rectangular or square cross section, this would get a little difficult and challenging, but for now let's, con let's confine ourselves to any kind of rectangular cross section. So um, I'm going to then have, so then this would have some height h here. This would have height h. And again, let me just draw the section, and I'll show the section um, here. But first, let me show the neutral axis here. So I'm going to draw the neutral axis. It does not necessarily need to be in the middle. Um, if you had a purely, no, if you had a, a say, a, a purely concrete beam or a purely steel, or you couldn't really do this with a pure concrete beam, but you could with a pure steel beam, for example. If you had a symmetric steel beam, then the, uh, if you had a symmetric steel beam, then the neutral axis would remain at the center of the cross section, or the centroid of the cross section, but um, with concrete it gets more complicated, so I'm just going to draw it at the center for now, but realize that in reality the neutral axis need not actually be at the centroid of the cross section, because we have two different materials thing here, and things get a bit more complicated as we're going to see now. So let me go ahead and label this as a neutral axis. So this is going to be the neutral axis. So this is rebuilding a lot of the beam theory uh, we learned in mechanics and materials. And if you're wondering, if, you're, if, you, if you'd like to do a review of some of that, please feel free to see my uh, CENG 3306 review, uh, videos. I have a full set of mechanics and materials course lectures uh, already prepared and organized into a, nice little, uh, into a nice little playback or playlist here on YouTube. So go ahead and check that out if, you, uh, if you're interested or need a mechanics and materials review. If I can manage to draw a straight line. Okay, so next, uh, so previously I had the cross section, or pre previously I had the side view, and I'm just going to draw, draw out the cross section here. And as a reminder, for this particular problem, now I'm not going to work through the entire problem through here, I'm going to develop a lot of the things we need, and then later in the next lecture I'll actually work through this uh, with numbers. And so we have an H of 20 inches and a B of 14 inches. Now, um, I want to look at uh, both strain and stress. So first, let us look at strain and stress. And we would look at how this would, first let's look at how this would work um, if everything were nice and simple. If this were a, if this were a, um, let's look at this if this were a case of say this were pure concrete or pure steel, etc. So uh, from here on, this would be, uh, would, this would be um, how stress and strain would look. Well, the strain will always be this way, but um, let me just, you'll see, I'll just go, I'll just come on, comment and annotate as I go along. So um, first, let's draw the strain. Now, as long as everything remains linearly, linearly elastic, regardless of what's going on, the strain will remain, will remain linear. So in other words, we'll have a I'm assuming positive bending, so I'm assuming that the that the bottom fibers are going to be in tension and the, uh, and the top fibers are going to be in compression. So we have, uh, we're going to have, this is going to be strain, and I would have some epsilon t, a maximum strain and tension, and epsilon c, a, max, a maximum uh, strain in compression. So epsilon c and epsilon t, and then I would have a strain distribution therein. And right at the neutral axis, I would have a strain uh, of zero. Now, um, in the case of something that was a uniform material, so this is going to be, this kind of thing is, uh, again, this is strain, but this kind of linear strain is really always true. 
uh, this will be true as long as everything remains linearly elastic. True, uh, in, well, actually, really in all cases. Um, true even with composite materials. Even with composite materials like reinforced concrete. What I'm going to draw next, though, is, would really only be true if I had a, a single material um, throughout the beam. So what I'm going to draw next is actually fundamentally impossible, but it's going to be kind of a review of how things would work if this were, a, say, a steel beam. or a Well, you wouldn't have a steel beam that big, but you might have a large wooden beam or something. And or you could have a, oh it, you could have a concrete beam like that as long and it would uh, now we normally consider this tensile strength of concrete to be zero but if as long as you kept that load incredibly 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 small I suppose you actually could do that but that would be a bit silly but I suppose you could so um, now I want to show the stress and how this look oh, I want to do this in red. So consider stress, and I would have something like this. If it were made of the same material, I would have a linear relationship between, uh, I would also have a linear relationship, um, and I would have some sort of sigma max here, sigma max compression, and sigma max intention. But as long as it was in, as long as it was a um, as long as it, is a, it was a uniform material all the way through, I would assume that stress also is linear here. And so I would have a linear distribution of, and that should be a T there. there I would assume there's also a linear distribution of stress. That's not, I know, that, I know it looks like there's two different slopes there. That's just my poor art skills. Okay. And then from this, though, I would have two equivalent forces. Um, you might remember in mechanics materials doing this where you can say that these two force triangles or two stress triangles can then be, can then be combined or can can then be found can be uh, treated as equivalent point forces so if i want to if i have this stress distribution and i want to find so for example as if everything was the same material i could simply take the strain here and multiply by the uh, modulus elasticity here oh actually that's say c sorry about that that's that's a stupid mistake um, as long as this was all the same material, if I wanted to know the max stress in compression, I could just take the maximum uh, compression uh, strain and multiply by the modulus elasticity. If I wanted to know the maximum tension stress, I could just multiply uh, the max tension strain by the modulus, modulus of elasticity. And again, this is if um, stress, if, uh, if same material and linearly elastic, but not outside the elastic zone. Uh, stress, if same material, actually let me label that as stress, and then in parentheses, uh, if same material, and uh, under the elastic limit, elastic stress, or stress limit, we could say, we're going to combine it all together. And I could then um, find the equivalent forces or equivalent point loads to these and say, okay, well, there's going to be some, based on this max compression uh, stress, I could combine this together and say, okay, that's an equivalent uh, point load C. And then I could also say, oh, there's some equivalent tension load T. And then putting those two together, I could just say, oh, well, that is going to be some, um, Taking those two together, I could then just find the distance between them and uh, say, okay, well, they, they must be equal. Compression, the overall, uh, if, if this thing's going to be in equilibrium, C does have, the magnitude of C does have to equal the magnitude of T. And I could just say, oh, the overall moment capacity of this thing, or the overall moment present here, is just uh, T uh, times the distance between them, or the, 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 it's a couple at that point. It's the magnitude of the force times the distance between them, and that would be a very easy way of calculating moment capacity. The problem, of course, is that, you now yes, this will work for very simple things like a uniform cross-section or a rectangular steel beam or a steel plate you're using in strong in strong axis bending or something, but the problem with this, uh, for or you could use like a, I guess this would work very well for like, this would also work very well for like an HSS section or something like that. However, the problem with this is really that, um, uh, 
that concrete, of course, is a composite material. It's not the same material all the way through. It's not even like it's some weird amalgam of steel and concrete. It is, we have very clear sections where it's steel and very clear sections where it's concrete. And so that's the real tricky part about this. Oh, and even worse, um, we know that, so I, I said this would work as long as concrete, if, I could say this would, I, I just said that you could create something like this as long as you used only concrete and you, you, could, use, you could create some stress distribution like this in concrete as long as you used um, only concrete, no steel, and you kept the stress incredibly, incredibly, incredibly low so the tiny amount of tensile capacity concrete has would not be overwhelmed. But of course, we know that's not the case. We know that steel beam uh, re that we know re reinforced concrete beams are going to use steel as the reinforcement, and we're going to and, and we realize that, tens that concrete has almost no um, has almost no uh, uh, tensile capacity. So, let's move on beyond this simple mechanics and materials model and consider how we actually uh, calculate the capacity, the moment capacity of reinforced concrete beams. And specifically, we are going to design around reinforced concrete at the ultimate strength. At the ultimate strength. At ultimate. So reinforced concrete at ultimate. So previously, uh, here I was looking at a simple, uh, you know, homogeneous beam, etc. But uh, next, I'd like to look at uh, something else. Um, I'd like to look at something that's a bit more realistic for what a concrete beam would actually look like. So uh, here, let's look at an actual. What some, let's look at some, uh, what an actual concrete beam might be like. So um, first of all, I would have. Let's look at my side view, and this might be a bit more complex. Now the H is going to be the same. That's not going to change. Uh, so let me just label this side view. And then I'll also do the cross section, so side view and cross section. Side view and cross section. And I would have my distributed load W ultimate across the top. W ultimate, W sub U. And this thing would still have a depth H. We would still have a depth H. Now, um, we have to add something a bit more interesting, though. And that, of course, is our reinforcement. Now, if you haven't picked it up from as I've been alluding to it, or if you don't remember it from this class, our discussions in this class already, or others, uh, we know, of course, that concrete is, the concrete as a material is crap for tension. It can, it is almost, it has very, 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 very little tensile capacity. So, um, oh no, before I do this, I, before I label that or describe what that is, I want to actually also mention that at the cut, we will, of course, have the same moment M and our shear V as well. Sorry about that. Let me just fish, put that in for completion. Although we're not going to be concerning ourselves with our shear load V today. Anyway, um, this here, consider our uh, reinforcement. Again, we know that in general, um, our, uh, we know of course that in general, uh, concrete, or actually not in general, just in all cases, concrete has very, very little tensile capacity. So um, we of course, uh, if we're going to use it, we're really only going to rely on it for compression capacity. So in other words, if you think back to, that back to beams, like a long beam, uh, maybe I can draw it over here. Um, maybe as a note, uh, let's see, um, where do I want to put this? Okay, well, basic beam theory, of course. I'll just put a little squiggle over here to the side, maybe erase it after or something. If you think of a beam that is going to be in flexure, and I'm assuming positive bending, and again, this is definitely a review for mechanics and materials, but it may have been a while for some people. If you have a beam that is under uh, compression, that is under positive bending, well, you're going to have tension down here and compression up here, and we usually use positive for tension and negative for compression. So again, everything here is being pushed together, all the fibers here are being smooshed together, and all the fibers down here are being pulled apart. And so um, uh, that is why, fundamentally, when we design concrete beams, assuming for the simplistic case 
uh, we're only designing them for uh, positive bending like we are here, uh, in that case we only need, we're going to have reinforcement on the bottom, but the concrete up top is going to be just fine. I mean, uh, even if, and as we discussed before, yes, concrete will crack, but that doesn't matter. As long as everything is still remain, remains bonded together by some steel and by its own fr internal friction, that's not a big deal. Let it crack. And so all this has to do is bear up against each other, butt up against each other, and resist some great compressive load. So I don't really care if the concrete up here is cracked or not, as long as it's still holding itself together. So um, anyway. Okay. Now, um, so again, uh, that was of course, uh, again, as I mentioned, I made a little uh, aside to that. The, uh, this is assuming, everything we're doing here is assuming that we're only designing for positive bending. So uh, sometimes, especially for continuous beams, you'll have uh, the same beam be designed to withstand both positive and negative moment. In that case, you would end up having reinforcement in the pot up here and down here. And designing that is a bit trickier, so uh, we, might get that to, to, we might get to that later in the semester if you're curious, but um, for now anyway, we'll stick with uh, one way, uh, well not one way, uh, we'll stick with uh, positive uh, design only, positive moment design only. Now if you, now if you could uh, somehow had a beam that was only uh, that was only negative bending, like a cantilever or something, that would be trivially simple. You just do the same thing here except flip it, but um, anyway. Okay, so uh, this is what the layer of reinforcement would look like, and I'm definitely exaggerating. It probably wouldn't be that thick. It might, but probably not. So let's look at our uh, reinforcing here, and let's see what this would look like from the, cr uh, from the cross section. So it wouldn't look like a single rod here or a single bar. It would look like uh, something like this, where you had maybe three individual uh, rebar, uh, in three individual pieces of rebar here. And this is what it, it might actually look like. And uh, let's see, we, we would still have our H here and we would still have our B. B, of course, is going to remain our width of our section. But here I need to define a new variable. Um, this is going to be D. D is going to be the depth uh, from the t from the uh, outer compression surface of our uh, of the center of our uh, compression or sorry of our tension reinforcement. So uh, again, D is distance from center, not from edge, but from center uh, of reinforcement of reinforcing steel. Uh, two, uh, two here, let's say, um, to what? To our uh, outer compression fiber. To outer compression fiber. And if you're British, you can write it F-I-B-R-E. Anyway, so let's consider this. Now, let's look at this some more. Okay, and I'm still going to have my neutral axis, so I'm going to draw all of these surrounded by some sort of neutral axis. And I could label this here. So I'm just going to take this all the way across, and I'm going to create three more diagrams around this. This is my neutral axis here. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is draw the general state of strain. This is the general state of strain. Well, not general as in uh, three-dimensional or something, but uh, general state of strain here. Actually, let me draw it just more like this. And I'm going to call this uh, strain one uh, here. Well, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is make an assumption one. And I'll come back to these drawings here. So because of that, I'm going to have a strain one and a stress one, etc. OK, so my, my assumption one. Uh, my assumption one, and I'm going to create. I'm going to make two assumptions here, or two sets of assumptions. The first one is going to be my standard uh, reinforced concrete beam assumptions, or sorry, standard beam assumptions. And I'm going to assume that plane sections remain plane. Uh, remain plane uh, and also next I, we have a perfect bond between steel and concrete 
In other words, if the steel is going to, ex if the concrete is going to experience a strain at some depth, then the steel is also going to experience that strain. Between steel and concrete, uh, and concrete, assume a perfect bond between steel and concrete. Uh, we are going to assume that stress can be, and we're also going to assume that stress can be obtained from the stress strain diagram. Uh, be obtained from a stress strain diagram. So first let's look at the strain uh, here. So first let us look at the strain and I'm going to have a strain, I'm going to make a strain diagram uh, based on assumption one or the first set of assumptions. So I could call this strain one, uh, strain one, and I would have a strain that would be linear across the whole thing. Now, I would have uh, some constant a slope strain all the way along, and here at some level I would have EC max, the max strain in the concrete. And then I would have some, uh, sorry, not EC, sorry, epsilon C. That would just be whatever the maximum strain in the concrete, or actually more appropriately, I should say max strain in the in compression, but that's going to be concrete for this case. And then I would have some uh, ES. And ES is the strain in the steel. ES is the strain in the steel. Now, uh, so ES is the strain in your steel. Now, what's interesting about this, let's see, is one interesting thing about this is, no, the actual maximum tension strain would have to be higher, but the uh, the tension strain, the, the tension uh, reinforcement is not at the very bottom of the beam. It can't really be. Uh, it's going to be at the, uh, it's going to be at the centroid of your steel. Oh, one other note on that D, the centroid of your steel. This might get a few people if you're not careful. Uh, sometimes you don't have all of you, I'll erase this after this because it's going to confuse my diagrams otherwise, but um, if you have more than one row of reinforcement, the, uh, the D, the depth, the, the depth uh, D, is defined down to the centroid, so it would be down at this depth here. It wouldn't be like at the bottom here. It's the, you take the centroid of each uh, piece of, uh, take, the, take the combined area centroid of all the steel pieces that you have, the, all the pieces of rebar that you have, and then that's the depth of that is going to be your depth D. Okay, this is a random, very uh, off to the side side note. Next, uh, I'm going to create a, st a, st a stress diagram based on this and that we can obtain the knowledge that we can obtain the stress strain diagram from this. That we can obtain the stress from the stress strain diagram. So first of all, um, it's going to be, a, we, we want to realize that the steel is going to effectively have just one stress. Uh, that's not going to be exactly true because we do know that stress would, would, would be slightly more at the bottom of a piece of rebar than the top, but uh, for our purposes here, we're just going to say, look, uh, the, t the t t tension reinforcement is all approximately the same depth. This is an assumption we're going to make that's going to simplify things, make things more, more possible to solve. And so we're just going to say there's a point load T here. And, uh, and we'll look at that later. That T is going to be basically, uh, well, if it's tension controlled, it would be the ultimate stress in the member, or ultimate stress in the steel, etc. But we'll look at that. So basically, consider that all of the, uh, basically for this, assume that all of the, uh, that all of the, uh, all of the, what do I want to say, all of the uh, stress in the, uh, um, all, all the stress in the steel can be combined to into a single point load at this at, that's the same depth. Now, if you combine the, uh, now, getting the strain in the concrete is going to be really interesting because if we go back here, all the way, way back to the beginning, we saw that concrete doesn't really have a nice, even, linear stress strain diagram, especially near the ultimate stress. So if you actually plot out the uh, stress in concrete, if you combine those together numerically some way, and you need a more accurate graph than that, but you're actually going to get some uh, kind of interesting curve that looks very much unlike anything you've seen before. We would have a small amount of concrete uh, tension stress, and then we'd have something uh, like this, kind of a curve like this, a bit like this. And so you'd have a very, 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 very tiny amount of uh, compression stress, and that would be uh, epsilon C 
max. Uh, but as we'll see later, this is actually rather difficult to work with, so we don't tend to actually use this. Okay, but anyway, that's what it would actually look like if we could accurately plot out the stress. Um, it would look something like that in a, uh, both the, the stress in the steel, or this, in this case, the point force of the steel, and steel tension, and the stress distribution in the concrete. Uh, next, I'm going to make an assumption. And this assumption uh, seems arbitrary at first, but this actually does come right out of the ACI code. And this may be one of one or perhaps the only one of or perhaps the only uh, direct citation I'm going to make to the code today. Uh, assumption two. So assumption two, I am going to assume that the maximum strain on concrete um, is going to be the maximum strain that we're going to allow for concrete is not dependent on the type of concrete. It's actually a fixed value, 0 0.003. So 0 0.003, or in other words, 0.3%. And uh, this is actually supported by the code. It's found, again, in the latest edition, or at least in the 14th edition of ACI, 22.2%. Um, 22, uh, 22 Okay, uh, so this is basically arrives, uh, this is a strain value. Now, we're going to assume that concrete can have different uh, maximum stresses. We're going to assume that concrete can have different modulus of elasticities, or moduli of elasticities, I or elasticity, I suppose, moduli of elasticity. So uh, in steel, we, if you remember, we assume that all steel has the modulus of elasticity, if you're using English units, of 29,000 KSI, or 29 million P PSI. In concrete, our yield stress, so in steel, your uh, E, your capital E, stays the same, your modulus elasticity stays the same, um, while your, uh, while your strain and your, um, while your strain and stress vary. In uh, concrete, we're going to assume that our strain remains the same, our maximum, our maximum ultimate strain remains the same, but what changes is our maximum stress and our modulus of elasticity. So at least for normal concrete, uh, and you'll, you can discuss, you can read about this more in the, in the manual, but essentially we get, we're going to consider normal concrete to be, um, uh, most cases of normal concrete, in normally designed beams, we're going to say that they have a maximum uh, strain of 0 0.003. And that's, this comes out of uh, many years of laboratory analyses, laboratory experiments, uh, in the field measurements, uh, this is kind of a safe, uh, widely reliable value. And I also want to define C. And this also comes from the manual. C, D, H, and B are all in the manual. Um, and C then is going to be the distance. Now this is not something you can know right away. This is something you're going to have to calculate. Uh, distance um, from extreme compression fiber from the extreme compression fiber to the neutral axis. Uh, to the neutral axis, and with this I will have enough knowledge or enough information to create my final plot on this line anyway. The neutral axis. Okay, and next, here, uh, oh, and I should have probably labeled this stress one, the stress that comes out of um, one. I'm not going to necessarily draw a, a stress yet. Uh, then I'm going to label stress two. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to have a stress two because the assumptions of two just allow for uh, more, um, just allow for more uh, a, a simplification or an elaboration on the strain diagram. So the strain for two now, for, based on assumption two. So again, when I say strain two or stress one, for strain one and stress one, these are the strain curves that get created based on assumption one or the stress curves. When I say strain two, I'm talking about the strain curve or the strain diagram that is created based on assumption um, two. Okay then, uh, so next I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have my ultimate stress in compression, or sorry, my ultimate strain in compression. And I'm going to say, I'm going to put this as a fixed value. That epsilon C ultimate 
is going to be 0 0.003. And then based upon this, I'll also have at the same level as the, again, at the same level as my tension reinforcement, I'm going to have just some unknown, um, some unknown uh, epsilon uh, s. Epsilon s being the strain in the steel. So I have EC, which is the strain, uh, as a reminder, I'm going to be using going forward. EC is the concrete strain, concrete max strain. And epsilon s is going to be the steel max strain. And uh, for dimensioning sake, I'll go ahead and provide a dimension on this. And the distance from here to here, again, from the outer compression fiber, that would be here, the location of the max compression strain, uh, the distance from there to there is going to be variable uh, c. That is a lowercase c. Okay? Now, um, I can also develop some math based upon this. So, uh, looking at this, let's consider some, uh, let's consider similar triangles here. Now, um, in fact, let me go and redraw this over here. So let's apply similar triangles. Apply similar triangles to, uh, and we'll need to use this going forward, uh, to strain diagram two. Okay, so let me redraw this briefly so you can see what I'm doing as I do it. So I'm going to have epsilon s here epsilon s, I'm going to have uh, epsilon, uh, I'm just going to say this is 0 0.003 for now, 0 0.003. I'll have this length, and I'm just going to go label this as c, and I also know that this whole length here, uh, from the outermost compression fiber to the centroid of this tension, of the centroid of the uh, um, reinforcing steel, is d. So that means this dimension from here to here. So if this is C and this whole thing is D, that means this is D minus C. So uh, then, now uh, this is not going to give me the final uh, a final thing that I'll need, but it will be a useful tool later on uh, when we develop something, when we develop a more complete capacity or a complete uh, expression for, uh, um, or a complete method for finding Oh, uh, uh, stresses and, and, and sizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so uh, here, let's apply similar triangles, and I can say this over this must equal this over this. Fairly straightforward. Similar triangles. Point zero zero three over c is going to be equal to epsilon s divided by d minus c, or I can also say that epsilon s is going to be equal to point zero zero three. Uh, that's too many O's, 0 0.003 times D minus C divided by C. Now, at first, this may seem intractable. This may seem like, uh, how would you uh, use this to solve for anything? But as we'll see, uh, and we will see that later on, but let's think about something. Um, what if we uh, assumed, for example, um, okay, so at first this seems intractable. How are we going to solve this? Now, initially you probably would know your d if you're if you're checking uh, if a um, beam is adequate and you already know your the depth of the steel. That would be fairly easy to to get that. You would already have that d. The hard part is this c. Uh, we don't know the c. The c, uh, the level of c, the depth, the, the neutral axis. That's just a that is not something you physically you don't build the neutral axis. Well, from a certain point of view, you do, but you don't literally build the neutral axis when you uh, physically construct a beam. It is create where the neutral axis happens to be at any one time is an interaction of the materials, the geometries, and the loads that are applied to a beam at a particular uh, moment in time. So. Um, C is something that doesn't that isn't really physical. It's uh, it, it's simply the location of the beam where things switch from tension to compression, or compression to tension, depending on your point of view. Uh, so at at first it seems like we have well this is definitely an unknown, and at first this seems very difficult to know as well. But I want to get your brain start thinking and start chugging a bit if I can. We know that uh, for linear elastic materials uh, remaining under their elastic state. We know that strain is going to be what? We know that strain is stress over E, right? 
we know that the strain is equal, going to be equal to uh, stress over the modulus elasticity. So think about steel, though. What, what, what would happen, for example, if you were to assume that your steel was in the state of yielding? If you assume that your steel was at the yield stress, suddenly you could calculate a, a steel strain, and then suddenly you could calculate C, and then suddenly you, knew, you would know the stress distributions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Although we can't quite do that yet because we really do need to simplify this complex stress block, uh, complex stress thing first. But we'll keep an eye on this because we'll be using this later on. This is a basic relationship, but um, this one may be more useful in certain cases. So next, I'm going to draw a couple more, um, a couple more things here. Uh, maybe another set of diagrams on the next page. So I'm going to draw two more diagrams, and these are both going to be stress diagrams. And both of these are going to be centered around the uh, steel, or sorry, around the concrete. The, the steel has already been simplified as much as we can simplify it. So let's draw the neutral axis. Boom, 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 just a dashed line all the way across the page. Neutral axis. And uh, the first, I'm going to make an assumption three. And so let's describe that. Assume three, or assumption three. Assumption three. Uh, I'm first going to ignore any tension capacity in the, in the concrete. Ignore any tension capacity in the concrete. And that is that is in the ACI code, but I don't have the reference for that off the top of my head. Oh, I don't have that in my notes right now. Well, actually, I do have it in my notes, but unfortunately, in my notes, it's for the old edition. I need to I need to cross reference that with the newer edition. Uh, but anyway, um, so I'm going to ignore tension capacity of concrete. Again, uh, concrete, truth be told, just like everything, does have some tiny, tiny, tiny bit of um, tiny bit of tension capacity, but it's so small, we're not going to rely on it. It's so small, and more importantly, unreliable, um, that we're not going to, uh, we're just going to assume it's zero. And next, I'm also going to assume elastic plastic material, or elastoplastic material um, for steel, or behavior. Elastoplastic behavior for steel. In other words, I'm going to assume the following. I'm going to assume that steel behaves like this. I'm going to assume that steel has, uh, again, we're going to, even steel's uh, stress strain diagram is more complex than this, but we're going to make, a, make an assumption that will simplify our analysis. And this is an assumption in the conservative direction, so it's safe to use. So we're going to have a we're going to say that up to a certain point, everything remains perfectly linear, and then past that point, we're going to say things just yield infinitely. So, in other words, um, so again we have our we're going to have our epsilon y here, our yield strain, and our yield stress, our sigma y, or actually we could say f y. Uh, if we were doing uh, steel, but we can just call it F, lowercase fy for now. Okay, um, just based on the stress that's present, etc. So again, it, this is a simplification. In reality, if you remember steel, it's going to have a, after some long region of uh, yield plateau, it's going to get some strain hardening, the crystals will realign, the, you know, the stars will realign, and everything will go to ultimate strength. Uh, anyway, you'll get strain hardening, and you'll get some ultimate strength that goes up like that, and then before finally failing. Um, but we don't really want to rely on that for uh, concrete design, especially because those types of strains required for that, your uh, concrete is going to be just completely busted up and unusable, so we're not going to rely on that. Now, um, so let's look at what kind of, a, what kind of uh, stress uh, distribution we would get by doing that. And we would have something like this. So we would have our point load from our tension. We would have some tensile point load here. And 
then we would just, uh, back here, remember how we said that there would be some small amount of tension stress in the concrete? We're going to say that's gone and we are only looking at the compression stress. So that is now being simplified to just this. Just a weird, funky compression stress block here. Kind of like that. It doesn't actually go to zero, that's just a, that's a low value on that end. So it actually, it's lower here, then it increases here, then it goes down a bit uh, towards zero at the neutral axis. Okay, but you, if you're looking at that, you're probably scared because you're just, you may be like, okay, what the heck is that actual equation? What does that mean? How do I actually do calculations with something uh, with a squiggle you just drew on the board? Uh, have no fear, uh, we can, uh, we have a way of dealing with this. So this would again be your uh, sigma uh, C, your concrete stress. Uh, and for that, we're going to need to use assumption four, which in some cases, or well, or at least uh, I should say, um, uh, according to some concerns, or from a certain perspective, is probably the best way of saying it, uh, maybe the most powerful assumption um, in the um, in our uh, method here, and also perhaps the one that is the most difficult to grasp because it's it's the one you probably haven't seen before, and that is the Whitney stress block assumption four, and that is going to be the Whitney stress block. So let's look at this. So first I'll just write it, then I'm going to write up here what we would have. So when looking at, so this would be, uh, let me call this stress three, and this one here is stress four. So drawing this out, I'm going to say, okay, well, this the tension isn't going to change. That's going to be a nice point load like we've already reduced it to. And don't worry, you're not going to actually have to draw all this out every time. This is not steps in order to solve a problem. This is me developing the theory of how we're going to handle uh, reinforced concrete design, or reinforced concrete beam design anyway. And so um, looking at this. now. This is a pain in the butt. It really is. I mean, look at this. We have something that's not zero at this end. It's some unknown value, some complex value. It goes to zero, and there's some curve. And I'm sitting here going, okay, what is that? Is that a parabola? Is that a sine function? What on earth is all this nonsense? I, I don't want to have to design like that. I, it, eh, that's just a nightmare just looking at that. So how do we get around that? Can we get around that? What I'm thinking is, wouldn't it be really nice, instead of having to, you know, have a function for this stress and then having to integrate, integrate across the depth, I mean, if you gave me the stress function, I could actually find an equivalent point load of this, but I'd have to integrate across the depth, yada, 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 it would be not fun. Instead, what if I said, okay, is there just some equivalent stress that maybe doesn't go all the way down, but is there just some value of stress we could assume that... Uh, that would be constant up to a certain depth. This would make things very easy. That would be constant up to a certain depth, and then the total stress area of this thing would be equal to the total stress area of this thing. And uh, you might think that's impossible. Uh, Ms. Larson, how would you ever do that? That's impossible. You're uh, talking crazy, but have no fear. It actually is possible. And that is the Whitney stress block. So let's consider this. And um, here, now let's see, the first thing I need to consider is that I'm going to have a, I'm the, again, I need a way of transforming this into a uniform stress block. So I'm going to discuss this here. The first thing, uh, as I mentioned here, C is the overall distance from here to here. And it's the distance from the outermost compression fiber to the neutral axis which is just going to be C. Okay, so our little curve there, our ugly curve, had a depth C, or height C depending on your perspective, had some height C. Then, so let's say we have this, some depth C, and then, um, so this is, then I'll draw the original one more time. This is the weird stress, uh, the difficult to work with, uh, scary stress going, the, well, it's going the wrong direction. Let me, make, let me make it go the right direction. There we go. Now, what I want to do is, I am, and that is, that's supposed to be a C, wow, C. And this is going to be transformed into something different. 
I'm going to take this and find an equivalent uniform stress. And again, uh, this comes out of years of laboratory study. Uh, you can, it's named after the Whitney stress plot. It's named after Whitney because it was named after uh, Professor Whitney, and you can go and read through the history of that if you please. But that actually would be an interesting project to read up on or to... I wish I had more notes about Whitney here, but it might be interesting to talk about. Anyway. So uh, here, we, uh, the, the actual value of the stress, we need some value of it, and it's going to be 0.85. The value of that constant stress is going to be 0.85 F prime C. Okay, what the heck is F prime C? Uh, again, have no fear. Larson is here. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's uh, late at night, but that's okay. Maybe. Um, F prime C is going to be uh, your concrete compressive strength. This is the value you get from my strength test. This is your concrete compressive strength. This is your concrete compressive strength, okay? So again, that's just a material property that would be, that would actually come from laboratory tests or uh, depending how you're doing it. If you already now, if you uh, if you're actually designing, oftentimes you won't uh, you know you won't get your concrete strength by testing it. You'll you'll actually say you know in your specifications in your drawings, uh, concrete used in this building or in these beams must be uh, must have a 28 day compressive strength of 3,000 uh, psi or 4,000 psi or something like that. Often you as a structural engineer will actually specify what kind of concrete strength is required. And uh, you might think, oh, well, now of course as a structural engineer, it's beneficial in most cases to use a stronger concrete, but the downside of course, like everything else, if it's stronger, as a general rule, it's going to be more expensive. Okay, and so we're gonna have a stress block that's going to be at the, the maximum value of it, or the value of it, the uniform stress value, is going to be 0.85 F prime C. And then um, it's going to go down to a certain depth A. It's not going to be the full depth C. It's instead going to go down to some depth A. And now we have another variable. And A is equal to beta 1 times C. A is equal to beta 1 times C. Now I know beta 1 is another new variable, and we'll have to discuss that. It's a factor that we will use uh, in a bit, that we'll learn how to find in a bit. Okay, so um, let's discuss the beta 1 factor first. Um, the beta 1 factor is just a sort of a, determined by a sort of an empirical formula or an empirical method. Again, the beta 1 factor is going to give you the ratio between the, uh, again, this is A here. The beta 1 factor is going to give you the ratio between A and C, A being the actual depth of your Whitney stress block and C being the depth of your neutral axis. Now, how do we get beta 1? So beta 1 factor such lovely variable names in concrete design. Uh, so first of all, um, it'll, it's, it is going to be rated based upon your um, based upon your uh, level of, of concrete, your not level of concrete, your strength of concrete. So your bog standard or your default, maybe not your bog standard, but your default value that you often assume, uh, is going to be 0 0.85. Maybe not default, but just uh, anyway. For, yeah, I suppose you could say for uh, this, for regular concrete. So um, for regular concrete, where you have um, F prime C less than or equal to 4,000, if your concrete stress, and so uh, when I say bog standard, I'm, uh, you use this a lot in design, so you kind of get used to it. So, um, and most concretes, you're, I kind of consider it everyday kind of normal regular value for concrete strength to be 3,000 psi. Although you can have a lot of variation there, but if the regular concrete is 3,000 psi, most of the time you're going to use a beta one value of 0.85. But we also want to mention that if you do have higher strength concrete. Uh, you are you're going to need to reduce your beta one value again. This just comes out of laboratory studies. So if you ask me to, der to derive this formula, I can't do that for you. This is coming out of laboratory studies, and the result, the empirical equations that come out of these, have been incorporated into design codes. So the equation for this would be 0.85 minus, uh, ton, uh, minus the quantity F prime C minus 4,000. 
uh, times 0 0.05. 0 .0, times 0 0.05. And uh, so notice the larger f prime c is, the smaller beta 1 is going to be. And you use this one when f prime c is greater than 4,000 psi. But you notice also, though, look, when f prime c equals psi, uh, this is going to equal the exactly the same. This is going to equal 0.85. So at the case where they where they're ex the f prime c is exactly 40, uh, 4, uh, 4,000 psi, it really doesn't matter which one you use because they'll produce the, the same result. But we do have a uh, a um, uh, sort of a proviso on this, and this one that your b your beta one minimum your beta one minimum is going to be equal to 0 0.65. Is equal to 0 0.65. So here, you're going to So if you have very high strength concrete, you might start calculating that. Oh, my beta one is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So for example, say beta one was 6,000. This would be uh, 6,000 minus uh, 2,000. Uh, so that would be divided by 20. So that would be uh, well. Let's see. Does that sound right? Yes, that may work. But any anyway. Uh, let's see, so f prime c minus that. So if you had 5,000 um, here, anyway, but that's the basic idea. So, okay, I might need to check up on that, but uh, okay, here, let's see, let me double check something here, minus that, yes. Okay, anyway, that's the basic idea. And uh, I may come back and talk about that a bit some more later. But again, just looking at some basic values, I'm, I'm trying to do a sanity check on this. I believe this should work, but things can be a bit different. So if I use a value, for example, of um, 6,000 minus 4,000, and then times 0.05, uh, well, no, no, that equals, and then times 0.05, yeah, that's not quite realistic. There's got to be a better way of calculating that. So here, well, it does say uh, beta 1. Let me look at beta. Uh, well, we do. I do have the table in front of me. Let's just go there and find out. Ah, I am missing a crucial factor here. I, was, I knew it. So I, I was looking at that, and that didn't look quite right. So I am uh, missing an incredibly important factor here. This whole thing is divided by 1,000. And if you're, knowing, if you're curious where I got that, I got that from a uh, table. Uh, this is found in table. Okay, the, the, again, the, the citations on the concrete code are always going to be very long and very interesting. 22.2.2.4 uh, Isn't the ACI lovely? Uh, anyway, that is not a, that is a actual citation. If you can, now, of course, any of you who have seen this code and are familiar with it, uh, this is going to seem obvious to you, but uh, again, this this video is created for people or for students who uh, um, or for students who are seeing this for the very first time. So uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, I was missing an over a thousand there. In fact, I'm just going to correct my notes right now. Fix that over one thousand. That makes more sense. So for example, now if we had an f prime c of six thousand, and I did have a quick calculation here divided by the uh, uh, let's say. So if I did 6,000 minus 4,000 would equal 2,000, then divided by 1,000, and then times 0.05, that would be 1, and I would end up with a beta 1 of 0 0.75. However, if I use a very high value, like 8,000, um, then I would uh, have, if I had anything higher, like let's say I had a 10,000 PSI concrete, uh, that would be, uh, 10,000 would be, uh, uh, so that would be 6,000 divided by 1,000.6, or just sorry, 6, and then times this would be uh, 0.3, that would be 0.55. If you did this enough, you'd eventually get a beta 1, a negative beta 1 value, which of course isn't realistic. Okay, so um, let's now look at the Whitney stress block uh, and see how this uh, all comes together. So uh, let's consider this. I'm going to look at the Whitney stress block and its effects uh, showing, um, um, sort of combining all these things together. Um, forces and stresses on the Whitney stress block. 
Again, beta is just used is going to be used to find your the depth of your stress block, and that will be necessary for equilibrium. So Whitney's stress block applied. The Whitney stress block applied. Okay. Um, well, maybe not applied yet. Well, I'll, I'll just draw it out and, and uh, have one sort of reference for all of this. Applied really is when we start finding actual moment capacity. Don't worry, we're almost through this. We're almost out of the woods, but not quite out of the woods yet. So, here, um, I'm going to have uh, my, let me show my neutral axis. Here. Nice long horizontal line for neutral axis. Then uh, at some depth d, I'm gonna have my uh, my steel reinforcing, my steel my tension reinforcing. So down at depth d, not at the outermost fiber, of course, but down at, de at depth d. Now um, I am going to make the assumption that steel is yielding. So. Again, I kind of hinted at this earlier, but I'm going to be I'm going to assume that steel is yielding. So in other words, I'm going to assume so this is sort of another assumption. We could actually make this an assumption. We could actually call this stress block five or stress five or something like that, but just for sake of brevity, I'll just say assume steel yields. So our T then, which we just previously labeled as T, if the, now, uh, because we're assuming that whole um, the behavior of, ten, of steel, where it simply has it goes, it, it simply has a perfectly linear slope and then just goes uh, constant strain after that, um, or constant stress uh, after that. Um, because of that, uh, if you're assuming steel is yielding, you know automatically that its stress is at the yield stress. And if I'm assuming the steel is yielding, and again, I'm assuming steel is yielding when at the ultimate uh, strength of the section. And so um, I'm going to say that the, I can then say that the actual tension force is uh, the area of the steel, AS, that's also found in the code, times Fy. Times Fy. So again, AS is the area of the steel, the combined area of the steel. And uh, Fy is the yield stress of the steel. So I am assuming that all of the steel is completely yielding. And so um, anyway, and, and the way we can do that is we're assuming that yeah, now that's uh, that's logical. That, that that's obvious if it maybe not obvious, but it's. Uh, easier to accept if it's at one layer, but at two layers that seems a bit iffy. But um, the way that would happen is that, again, uh, we're assuming that perfectly constant stress for uh, greater strain. So even if you, if now, it wouldn't, as you applied load, yes, the, top, the upper layer would yield before the bottom layer, but we're assuming at the ultimate stress that all of the steel has yielded. Then I'm going to have um, that, uh, I'm going to have my nice uniform Whitney stress block. I have a Whitney stress block like this here. And the stress level of this is going to be 0 0.85 F prime C. So in other words, 85% of its maximum compression strength. 0 0.85 F prime C. 0.85 F prime C. And um, let's see what's next here. Uh, let's see. Now, to uh, to actually calculate my um, my, I need to calculate an equivalent. Well, first, actually, let me a couple more dimensions for our purposes. Um, first, I have, and this is going to be a review or a, a repetition of what we had previously. This is uh, a is the depth of our stress block, and c is the depth of our neutral axis. C is the depth of our neutral axis. Now, and that's going to be lowercase c, and, then, and I know those kind of blend together in my writing here uh, because we don't have any lines or anything, but this is a lowercase c. We're also going to have an uppercase c, and that's going to be used in a bit. So what I want to find, so I have an equivalent 
uh, what I have is that I have an equivalent uh, tension load, an equivalent tension point force, but I would, what I would also like to get is an equivalent uh, compression point force. So I have a big T for that, for tension. But what I would also like is an equivalent uh, compression point load. And uh, in order to be in equilibrium, T is going to have to be equal to C. So um, based on that, I, but I need some way of getting this uh, in terms of the things I already have. But anyway, I know if, and I know they have to be equal because they are going to be, uh, if I sum moments of the surface in the x direction, those two things have to be equal. Then I'm going to divide, I'm going to div, uh, define another quantity, and that is the quantity JD. Uh, not J sub D, just JD. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, label, I know. But that is simply the distance between C, between capital C, I'll make that clear, this is a capital C, uh, and T. So C is going to be located uh, in the uh, middle of your, C is going to be located at the middle of A, or just A over 2, so that would be A over 2 from the top. C is going to be located at the middle of the Whitney stress block, and it's going to be equal to some value. JD is simply the distance from C to NT, or maybe distance C to T. Okay, and then all of this would come together um, to form, if I have two forces of equal magnitude separated by some distance, I'll get a couple and uh, I'll get some uh, moment m. Now, if I knew one of these and I knew this, this would be very easy. But unfortunately, I don't. Uh, I would have to, I'll have to do some calculations and we'll see this. Okay, so, but first of all, I need to find a way of expressing this capital C point force. Now, this is something that in my experience sometimes gives students trouble, so let me try to draw out something a little bit three-dimensional, and this is always a bit challenging, so, or a bit risky, so let me try to draw this out over here. And if it explodes in my face, oh well. So I'm going to draw this cut plane, this plane, but from sort of an isometric point of view, or at an angle. So this is a sort of three-dimensional view of this. Now, uh, this whole thing is going to have a uh, a, a, a width b. Remember, this is a this would be the cross section, and we would have a overall length of h, or a beam depth of d. Now, I would have also my tension uh, my tension force my tension force t which I maybe could say is along here, tension force T, and uh, that would be, um, I can label that here maybe, just up far to the side, as uh, D. D is the depth of the tension reinforcement. Now I want to kind of draw out the Whitney stress block in three dimensions. So this is kind of like a pressure prism or an area prism, and it's going to kind of be like this. So constant stress all the way along. So let's go, oh, let's say down to here. Like this, and like this, and then um, something like this here, and like this here. So it's a rectangle. Now, if you remember from mechanics materials, we did something like this in certain cases. Now, uh, the width of this thing, or the, the width of this thing, is the stress, and that's going to be 0.85 f prime c, and the, the uh, so that's the actual value of the stress that it's experiencing, and if you remember the idea of, of uh, pressure or volume, of pressure prism sort of, the uh, volume of the thing, the quote unquote volume, is going to be equal to the actual uh, magnitude of the force applied. So this here is going to be your A, and my equivalent point force C would be the combined, effectively, volume of this thing. So if I can find its area and then multiply by the stress, that would be the, uh, that would be the actual expression for C. So this thing has a width B, it has a, a height A, and a depth F prime C. So I can then, from that, I have an expression for, uh, for C. This is going to be 0 0.85 F prime C that is the stress that's going to be applied across this whole area, 
Uh, so, that's, so you can think of it in terms of volume, or you can just think of it, okay, I have a surface of width B and height A, and across the whole thing is applied a uniform stress of 0.85 F prime C. So stress times area is force, uh, so 0.85 F prime C times A uh, times B. Times A times B. Okay. So, uh, and all of this sum to get somehow must come together to form a moment capacity uh, M. And this looks like a mess, but believe it or not, we've been working hard. When I, know, and I know we've been working at this a while, but we're almost to the finish line. I've just been building up all the pieces to really create a, our final nominal moment capacity. So our nominal moment capacity Nominal moment capacity hmm. So using what we know here Well first I, I said earlier that we assumed the tension steel yielded so I am going to say that T is equal to a s times F y Although the manual actually this the concrete manual will actually use a lowercase F y and if you want confirmation of that, you can actually go, let's see, to your, um, well, you can see it defined in your, um, uh, in the chapter two, they have a whole list of all of the abbreviations in the manual. And if we go there in chapter two, uh, that which is really just nothing but notations and terminology, and I see that on page, let's see, where is that hiding? Not in Greek, in the English. English lettering. Uh, in, let's see, page, yes, uh, page 20 in the manual, FY is the specified yield strength for non free stress reinforcement in PSI. So, yes, they use a lowercase uh, FY, uh, although sometimes in, in our, but of course, in the, uh, in the uh, AISC manual, they use a capital FY for yield stress. Anyway, steel versus concrete, different books, different authors, etc. And many different authors, many different authors, although um, each of them has, of course, many, many, many different authors as well. And I suppose they're probably actually, if you compared them, there's probably a, a fair amount of commonality, or at least some uh, names that you'll find in the author lists and uh, acknowledgments of both. Anyway, so we know that T is equal to area of steel times Fy, again, because we are assuming that the steel is yielding. Then, based on what we had earlier, we're assuming C, the, this is not the, uh, this C is not the depth of the, uh, this capital C again, is not the depth of the neutral axis, it is the uh, actual equivalent point load of all of the stress in the concrete, all the compression strength, uh, compression stress in the concrete, and the value for this is 0 0.85 F, uh, F prime C, or not the value, but the expression for it, times A times B. Okay, and then um, I'm going to assume, well not assume, I know from equilibrium that T is equal to C. And so T is equal to C, that leads us to, well, area of steel times Fy is equal to 0 0.85 F prime C uh, times A times B. And finally, take a look at this. A, finally something useful. A is equal to area of steel, Fy, over 0 0.85 F prime C B. F prime C times B. And this is finally, 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 at long last, after this long derivation, we finally have something we can use. Because, now this may not seem like much at first, but you notice as we've gone through this thing, everything up to this point, we've just gotten, more, for every step, we, for, it's almost like for every step forward, we've taken one step back. So we first, you know, we, we defined, we started with D, we started with our height, then we defined our D, then we defined C for our neutral axis, that really didn't help us with anything, uh, except we created this little relationship here, which was nice. Uh, then um, we had, 
uh, we defined a. Oh, hey, hey, look, a is beta 1 times c, but we need to define beta to get that. But again, a didn't actually really help us that much. Um, and then we, we caught our equilibrium expressions, but again, when we apply all that together, we finally get something that we can actually use. And what I mean by we can actually use is, uh, we don't, this is something, this is an expression that doesn't have any quantity that is non-physical, in the sense that, uh, when I say non-physical, now obviously neutral axis is a physical thing, but in the sense that when you're building a concrete beam, you, you don't say, oh, I'm building the neutral axis now. You're just, uh, the neutral axis depth depends on the load. And so, um, and same thing with A, but look at all this other stuff. Area of steel, the yield stress, the, F prime, the strength of the concrete, the width of the beam, all of that is based upon, um, all of that is simply based upon um, the dimensions and the materials of the beam, the physical aspect of the beam. So that's where this is very useful. So if you give, if you tell me that you have, so now finally, if you tell me that you have a steel of this strength, or if this strength here, and you have this much of it, and it's at a certain depth, and well, even not yet, if you just tell me that it's a, a certain strength, and it's at a, there's a certain amount of area of it, and you have concrete of this strength, and a, and a strength, and a beam of this width, and a beam of this width, I can tell you A, that'll tell me the, width, the depth of the Whitney stress block. From that then, I can again get the depth of the neutral axis, and for, then from that, I can get everything else about the beam. This is the key to unlocking this. However, though, I do need to add a caveat, and this expression is going to be for, for rectangles only, or rectangular beams only. Because if we go back to our expression for C here, we assumed a rectangular cross-section. So if you have something else, well, then this won't apply. Although in almost all cases, you're going to have a rectangular cross-section except if you have a, uh, the one case that you might not, where you, now you're not going to have something, generally you're not going to have something really weird in concrete design like a circular beam or a oval beam or a, uh, or a, you know, triangular beam, but where you do see, what you do see quite often is T-shaped beams. T-shaped beams, I-shaped beams, anything that can be created, anything, any shape that can be created out of formwork that is made of flat planes. But uh, for anyway, for now, we don't worry about that. We can look at T-shaped section. We can look at T-shaped sections another time. So um, again, this is our first useful thing, but we're not quite at our final moment capacity yet. But we're actually almost there, because we remember that our moment arm is JD. Our our term in uh, the concrete manual is JD. Uh, the term for the, mon for the uh, moment arm is JD, and let's look at this. This is going to be equal to, um, it's the distance from here to here. So JD is from here to here, and D is from here to here, so this is just D minus A over 2. Again, that's just D minus A over 2. It's D minus A over 2. So uh, I now have an expression for my moment for my moment arm, and once I have that, really everything else is cake. So um, I know that the nominal moment or moment is just equal to force times distance for a couple. In other words, it would be equal to the. T I could use the c for this, but it's going to be a lot easier to use the t. Uh, t times the arm length. If you remember from statics, if you want to know the moment produced by a couple, you just multiply the magnitude of one of the forces times the distance between the forces. And so that we have an expression for the uh, for that uh, moment arm length, again, uh, conveniently in terms of A, and then um, we can simply say, okay, it's T times AD, or it's going to be equal to uh, T times the term JD. And again, uh, I, I do want to remind you, uh, JD is one thing. It's not J sub D. It's not, I know it's kind of weird. It's not J sub D. It's not uh, something J times the beam depth. It's just JD. It, two things used together. And I'm, I'm sure there's an interesting history there which we could read up on. And then replacing JD, let's get rid of the weird symbols, but that'll work fine. Uh, concrete manual is always a little special. Um, so T times D minus A over 2, or simply the nominal moment capacity is going to be, uh, if I replace this tension with area of steel, Fy, As, Fy, and then times D 
minus a over 2. And suddenly, I have two very simple equations that I can use for uh, that I can use for designing uh, and cal or at least calculating or analyzing uh, reinforced concrete beams. So I can calculate the depth the uh, the depth of the Whitney stress block based on this formula, and based on this formula, I can calculate the nominal moment capacity. And next time we will actually look at uh, calculating um, at calculating a. Uh, uh, a worked out example including uh, our including our resistance factor. Notice this is all coming out of just this is all just coming straight out of um, straight out of equilibrium theory and mechanics of materials and such. There's no actual uh, uh, um, uh, strength reduction factor here. So um, again, here the Whitney stress block though does assume rectangular uh, regardless of, of the stress block. Stress block, so again, I'll put a final note on here. Maybe on the next slide. Here. Now, uh, the stress becomes, uh, the stress does become a rectangle. A rectangle, regardless, regardless of the shape of the beam. Now it's going to be a little more complicated for uh, a I shape because the the width is uh, because we have two different shapes essentially um, because we have two different B's essentially but anyway but regardless of width of beam or of shape of beam so if you have this here so for example let's look at something really weird that you'd be very odd to be to build. But I'm sure some architect has asked some engineer, some crazy architect has asked some poor structural engineer to build a building with these monstrosities in it before. So let's say you had a triangular beam here, and then you had something like this. And so you'd have your, uh, maybe your compression section up here. But uh, regardless of the shape, we're still going to assume, uh, and this is actually a valid assumption, it's just that the, this is a perfectly valid assumption, it's just that the, uh, um, the Winnie stretch block does actually produce valid results for this, it's just that uh, we, we can't use a, we can't use a rectangular area for B, it becomes more complex, and so because the B is changing. So we, calculating your, um, so calculating your effective C would be a bit more complex, but the actual stress block is still going to be a rectangle. So your actual stress block would still look like this, with a 0.85 f per mc, etc., and then a, a force t. So again, um, regardless of beam shape, a beam shape, uh, stress becomes a rectangle. And what I mean by that is that it would be a constant value. down to a fixed depth, to some depth. So again, remember, for the sake of concrete beam design, uh, rectangles are the only shape in the universe. So the only shape in the universe. So everything else, uh, I don't care what stress distribution you have, I don't care if it's triangular here in the cross section, I don't care if it's a, a realistic stress diagram um, based on the complex stress strain diagram of concrete. Everything in concrete beam design, in all cases, all of the stress diagrams collapse to a simple rectangle. Now again, actually calculating the force of this would be more complex. You'd have to, what you do is you'd calculate, you would say that the, there is a, a stress value, say 0.85 FMC, and multiply times the area of the triangle, and that would be the area of your uh, point load there, or the value of your point load there. And then you'd, have a, you'd probably apply the centroid of the triangle rather than the middle of the triangle. But uh, anyway, and it would be a little bit more complex further for T sections, etc. And I say I, you also have I uh, sometimes like highway girders are uh, I shaped sections for um, made of concrete as well. But anyway, uh, that's it for today. I just wanted to work all the way through a long form derivation of the equations of uh, 
of calculating the nominal moment capacity in a reinforced concrete beam. And we'll look at other variations of this, but everything really is going to build off of this. So do make sure you understand this. Do make sure you also understand very well all of the um, all of the uh, uh, diagrams that we went through, because ultimately all of this stuff is coming out of um, beam theory and mechanics, materials, etc. And if you really now, yes, if you just want to design a a very simple concrete beam, you can use this. But there are many times in the code where uh, in or in that you may encounter. Uh, when doing actual design in your careers, that these will not be applicable, and there will be certain provisos and exceptions and things that you'll have to apply. And you, uh, especially if you're doing something like an I shape beam or a T shape, that you may then have to go and bring this back to uh, elasticity theory and your basic beam theories. And so if you don't know how to do that, uh, you're going to have trouble. Or if you don't know how to do that, uh, you might have trouble with my exam. If I give you an I shape beam, uh, we'll find out. Or a T shape, we'll see how evil I'm feeling. All right, so I think I'll let you go. That has been a very long lecture today, but uh, that is what it is. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this. So I'll see you all in class. And as always, thank you.